you come together this morning, I really believe that there is uh, something powerful that God desires to communicate this morning. And the reason I, I can say this is, is this. Um, this happened about maybe a half of a year ago. Uh, I came to uh, prepare this morning, and as I sat down to prepare, uh, my heart started to do its thing, and it started to beat a little bit out of rhythm. And so I decided, you know what, I'm going to take some of that medicine that maybe helps get it back in rhythm. Part of that issue, though, is that it lowers my blood pressure and it lowers my heart rate even more. And so this morning, if I'm kind of clutching the pulpit so that I don't collapse, um, or if you see me fall over this morning, well, hey, Paul says to live is Christ, to die is gain. So no matter what happens this morning, it's all good, right? So anyway, but uh, I think, though, that that is often when the enemy attacks, when the enemy is desiring for something to be spoken, and the enemy wants to say, aha, wait, let's have our focus be on something else, whether it's for me as I share or for you as you hear what God wants to say this morning. I'm just praying that God is going uh, to speak uh, powerfully into this place, even if he's not doing it passionately uh, through me this morning. And that's what we need. We need to hear a word from God. So I want to invite you to, to join me in a word of prayer this morning. God, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it is living and active, that it is sharper than any two-edged sword. God, where our bodies are weak, we pray that you are strong. Because, Lord, you are stronger than anything that we can face physically, spiritually, emotionally, relationally. So, Lord, we need you to speak into this place this morning. And I pray that you would do so through the power of your Holy Spirit. Lord, would you take the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts, and would you use them for your honor and glory, because you are our rock and our redeemer. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And amen. Well, how many of you ever turn on uh, your computers and you see pictures like this? that may be floating around the internet somewhere. You know, Nicole sent me that picture a week ago, and I said, oh man, I have got to use something like that. Because you and I recognize this, that there are times when even though we are holding up the banner of joy, we just don't feel it. You know, you and I sometimes know, as we've been talking about throughout this series, of what it means to be a people of joy. We say that we want to have joy come from our hearts and lives. We know that we have heard about what it means to be a people of joy. And yet we understand that though we can say we need to be a people of joy, often joy can seem so elusive. And what we've been trying to say is that ultimately our joy needs to come from and in Jesus Christ and Jesus Christ alone. And yet more often than not, the reality is you and I don't experience joy. We feel the pains of this world. We see the things that are happening around us. We have the circumstances of life that you and I may face. There is the disappointment and the discontent that we can at times experience. Hey, thanks. Just in case, right? Just in case. All right. I love it. Thank you. Right? You and I can experience the discontent that comes. Maybe it's the unmet expectations that we have. It's the unmet expectations that we have in life. Maybe it's the unmet expectations that we have from our spouse. Maybe it's the unmet expectations that we have with our children. And all of these things have a tendency to want to steal away our joy. They're obscuring our view of God. And when that happens... All of a sudden, we feel like joy seems to be stolen away from us. By the way, sometimes you and I can also experience the things like unresolved conflict. How many of us have that unresolved conflict that comes in life, and those sort of things also seem to steal our joy? By the way, if you look at Philippians chapter 4, verse 2, that seems to be something that's happening uh, when Paul writes to the Philippian church, he's actually addressing here in this section two women, Yodia and Syncathy. And these two women seem to be having a disagreement. It's an argument with one another. And Paul actually gives them an imperative. He gives them a command that they are 
to what? Be restored and to be reconciled to one another. And, and so maybe there is some unresolved conflict happening in your life and in a relationship. And God is saying you need to be restored to one another in order to experience joy. Perhaps there's some unconfessed sin that's taking place in your life. It's stealing your joy. Instead of accepting responsibility, you're placing blame. And you're trying to say, this is why I'm experiencing this. Instead of saying, no, I know I need to confess these things to the Lord. Oftentimes, unconfessed sin can be something that also seems to steal our joy. But here's what's interesting. Paul seems to be saying that we need to experience joy no matter what our circumstances. We've been saying throughout this series that instead of trying to find joy from the circumstances of life, we're supposed to take joy into every experience that we have in life. Paul was able to get to the place where he said, I will find joy and rejoice always. Think about that. You hear Paul say this. We often say this as Christians, to rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. And there's a part of us that when we hear Paul say something like that, you're like, come on. Like, you can't really be serious. How am I supposed to find joy in every situation? How am I supposed to rejoice in what I'm going through? You wonder to yourself, is this really even possible? How are we supposed to rejoice when joy seems unspeakable. How are we supposed to rejoice when joy seems so unattainable? We think to ourselves that it's impossible. How, how do we take the joy of Jesus with us wherever we go? There's no doubt this is hard stuff. And in fact, I would say that it's humanly impossible stuff. And this is why we need God's word. Because it's here that we learn how we experience a joy that cannot be taken away from us. So if you've brought your Bibles, I want to encourage you to open them with me to Philippians chapter 4. We're going to be reading together verses 4 to 9. Of course, if you don't have your Bibles along with you, you can follow along on the screen behind me. But I want you to hear just in these six short verses what Paul has to say about how we experience joy. Notice, picking up at the fourth verse, Paul says, Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again, rejoice. Let your gentleness be evident to all. The Lord is near. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, with prayer and petition, present your thank with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard uh, from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. You know, the grass withers and the flower fades, but it is the word of the Lord that lasts forever. You know, if there are uh, four words that come out of this passage this morning, four time-inclusive words, they're words like this, always, nothing, everything, always. Always, nothing, everything, all. If you look at 2 Corinthians chapter 11, Paul shares uh, how he has been stoned, how he has been beaten with rods three different times. He shares how he's been shipwrecked on three separate occasions. He shares how he's even spent the night at sea. He writes here from prison. He writes knowing that he may face his death. He may go to his execution. And yet... Paul says, I will rejoice in the Lord 
Always. Always. I don't know about you. If I was facing any one of those things that Paul was experiencing, I would probably say there is no way that I would be able to experience that kind of joy. But Paul says, look, despite my circumstances, despite what I'm going through, I am trusting that God is bigger, that God is greater, that God is stronger than anything it is that I am facing. And so no matter what it is, I am able to rejoice. You know, it's almost as if Paul, Paul is hearing what people are saying. Oh, come on, Paul. You don't know what it is that I'm going through. Paul, if you really knew what I was experiencing, if you really knew the trials that I was facing, you would not be saying this. And Paul's like, no, I do. I know exactly what it is that you are experiencing, and yet I believe you can find joy in the Lord. Throughout this morning, keep these in mind, always, nothing, everything, all. When are we to rejoice? Always. What should cause anxiousness? Nothing. What should we pray about? Everything. How far does God's peace extend beyond all comprehension? And the reason that I bring this up is because I believe that as believers, our initial reaction might not speak into these words. Like when you and I are experiencing crisis, these are not the things that we often think about. Too often we have in our minds a spirit of discouragement and discontent. What happens when we're overwhelmed is that anxiety sets in. And as anxiety sets in, peace seems to be the farthest thing from our minds. And in that moment, you and I do not experience joy. But what I want us to understand this morning is that this is not where we need to stay. I believe that there are truths here in Scripture that if we apply them to our lives, they will set us free. There is a way in which our hearts and our minds can be guarded in Christ Jesus so that we are led to a peace that passes all human comprehension. There is a way where you and I can experience unspeakable joy. And so this morning, sometimes you'll hear me say that if you only have the capacity to remember one thing, this is what I want you to remember today. You have to fight for joy. Sometimes you have to fight for joy. You have to fight for peace of mind. Now, I know that that sounds contradictory, right? We're talking about peace. We're talking about a passage that talks about gentleness. And so all of a sudden you hear me saying that you have to fight for joy. But you have to remember that there is a battle that is going on for your heart and for your mind. And if you know that there's a battle, you have to be willing to fight. And so when you're in the battle, when you're saying, God, why don't I seem to be experiencing any victory right now? Why does it feel like I am constantly overwhelmed? God, why does it feel like I am losing day after day? You have to go back and fight and say, these are the truths that are going to set me free. You have to fight for joy when everything in the world seems to want to rob you of that. When everything inside of us wants to meet the fire with greater fury. When we experience the pain and everything inside of you says, I don't want to wait for you, God. I see what's in front of me. I want to go for it. I don't want to have to rely on you. When we're saying, God, you don't seem to be moving as fast as I want you to move. In those moments, you and I are tempted to go right back to the flesh. To rely on our own strength and our own power and the patterns that we have developed over and over again in our minds. And in those moments, Paul says, no, you have to fight for gentleness. You have to fight for prayer. You have to fight for all of these things that we see laid out for us in Philippians chapter 4, 4 to 9. And so how does this text teach us how we have to press in, lean in to fighting for joy? There's five things. The first is this. We fight for joy, which is always in the Lord. We 
fight for joy, and you have to know it is always in the Lord. What does Paul say in verse 4? Rejoice in the Lord always. I will say it again. Rejoice. Now let's be honest. As Christians, we know this verse, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, and we know it's true. We, the problem is, we don't like it. Right? I, I mean, we know that it's true. It's not that we don't believe it. It's not that we don't understand it. The problem is that when you and I are going through something that is emotionally raw, when you are going through a painful season in your life, and imagine if I or somebody else in the congregation said, well, the Bible says just rejoice in the Lord always. You know, you're going to say, excuse me? How am I supposed to rejoice in the middle of this situation? You know, you don't know what I'm going through. You don't know what I'm feeling. You don't know what I'm experiencing. And so while you may feel like saying, I don't need you, To tell me that I need to rejoice. The issue is, I'm not the one telling you. The Bible's the one telling you. And so we go to the truth of Scripture, and Paul is saying we need to rejoice in the Lord always. See, a lot of times we want to withhold our praise until the blessing comes. But what we've been saying throughout this series, it's not about the receiving of God's blessing. It is simply about rejoicing in the Lord. Our satisfaction needs to come in him. Our our sufficiency is in him. Our peace of mind is in him. Our pleasure is in him. Everything that we have comes from the Lord. Notice, this passage does not say rejoice in the Lord whenever you get the answer you want. Rejoice in the Lord. Whenever things seem to be going your way, it says rejoice in the Lord always. Our joy is in Christ. Therefore, our joy can be constant. If the joy is constant, the expression of our praise should match. You know, we should be in a place where we are always in a state of rejoicing. And remember, Paul is writing this from prison. He's writing this from a place where he doesn't know whether he is going to live or die. Paul was in prison, but his joy was in Christ. And what that means is that no matter what we are facing in the moment, no matter what trial we are going through, we can find joy in Christ. You might be in frustration right now, but your joy is in Christ. You might be experiencing trials right now, but your joy is in Christ. You may be experiencing grief right now, but your joy is in Christ. But look, beloved people, this is what you have to know. This is a decision you have to make moment by moment, day by by day. You have to decide in that moment how you are going to respond when everything seems to be collapsing around you. You have to decide, am I going to be a person who lives by the truth of God's word? Nobody else can do that for you. You have to decide, am I going to fight for joy in the Lord? And know that when I do, I will be able to find a joy that is unspeakable. Notice, second, we fight for joy from gentleness because the Lord is near. Verse 5 says, Let your gentleness be evident to all the Lord is near. Notice, interestingly enough, Paul does not say try to be gentle first and then you will experience joy. He says rejoice in the Lord always. I say it again, rejoice. And then he says let your gentleness be evident to all. Gentleness seems to flow out of a spirit of joy. We we see this so often. Gentleness and peace seem to go hand in hand. I mean, think about the people that you know in your life who display peace. 
And as they display peace, you will see they are also a people who seem to exude this gentleness. Now, some of you might be willing to say, well, that's just kind of their personality. That's just kind of who they are. They just seem to be a generally peaceful, gentle type of person. And yet, more often than not, when you talk to them, what you experience is this. They are people who have learned how to fight for joy in the Lord. They've had to learn how to take their thoughts captive for the Lord. They've had to learn how to take their tongues and make them captive for the Lord. They have learned how to respond to trials in a grace-filled way. People, do you realize how much stress would be relieved from our lives if we learned to let go of the grudges that we hold? How different would things be if you and I chose to respond from a place of gentleness? Think about how much energy it takes to be mad. Right? I mean, think about how you can go to bed at night and you're just thinking these thoughts in your mind over and over and you keep rehearsing in your mind the things that you want to say, the things that you wish you would say to someone else. And the longer these thoughts circulate in our minds, the more it just robs us of our joy. See, the reason that we wrestle with this is because gentleness always gets in the way of what I really want. Because when somebody hurts me, I want to hurt them back. Right? When somebody hurts someone that I love, oh man, I want to make sure I meet that with anger and resentment as well. I don't want to show gentleness to someone. I want to respond in the moment because I'm angry and because I'm upset. And the problem is that when you and I try to take control, we end up responding or reacting in a way that is not filled with gentleness and peace. And so in many ways, what we're reading here serves as kind of a, a slap in the face, kind of like a punch to the gut, because it reminds you that gentleness often runs to the opposite of our flesh. But gentleness is the only way by which we can live out the disposition that we are encouraged to live out in Scripture. In fact, Paul says this in 2 Timothy chapter 2, 1. He says, you then, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. See, you cannot be strong in grace while acting in anger and frustration at the same time. When Jesus says, love your enemies, you cannot do it unless you are approaching it from a spirit of gentleness. Look people, I want us to know that there is such an incredible blessing that comes when we approach people with a, with a spirit of, of gentleness. What it means is that you will never have to walk away from a conversation regretting something that you have said. You will never have to go to bed at night thinking that perhaps it is some action you have taken, some word that you have spoken that has kept that relationship at odds. Instead, when you choose to respond in grace, it heals broken relationships. And to the best of your ability, you would be able to say, I have tried to approach this situation, this trial, with gentleness problem is, is we hear these words from Scripture, and I think a lot, of, a lot of times we would rather approach life from a scorched earth policy, right? You know, it's just like, I just want to burn the place down because I'm so angry. And yet what Paul is saying is we need to have a spirit of gentleness. Now, I know you hear me saying this, and, and we hear that this is true, but if you don't want to obey for obedience's sake, what if, what if I were to say that we should show a spirit of gentleness because the Lord is near? Um, how many of you have memories from when you were a child and there were certain ways that you would act when you were around your parents than when you were not in their presence? 
right? So maybe you're at home, you're sitting around the dinner table, you're sitting up straight, you're showing good posture, you're speaking with proper English, you're not using foul language, right? You, you try to make yourself respectable. But then what happens when you're away from your parents? Oh, suddenly there are things that you might say, there are things that you might do, right? There, there's maybe language that you would not use when you're in their presence. And what Paul is reminding us of is, look, however you are going to act when you think the Lord is far away, how would you act when the Lord is near? Because the Lord is near. He is always seeing, always hearing, always knowing what we are doing. And if you think about the fact that the Lord is coming soon, right, if Paul is saying, look, the Lord is near, he could, he could return at any moment, how would we want to be living when the Lord does come near. And, and Paul is just saying, look, you need to show a spirit of gentleness. We fight for joy in the Lord. We fight for gentleness because the Lord is near. Third, we fight in prayer as we bring everything to God. We fight in prayer. Look at what verse 6 says. Do not be anxious about anything. But in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your requests to God. And the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now let's be honest about this, because as believers, many of us have this verse memorized. And we quote it, like, oh yeah, I am turning everything over to him. But the reality is that while we try to take things and give them over to him, we try to take back control so very quickly. And it's not that we're not anxious about anything. The truth is we get anxious pretty much about everything. And so we say, God, here's the situation. God, I'm giving it over to you. God, I'm lifting it up to you. God, do you hear me? God, are you there? God, can you act? God, are you going to act? Do you even have the power to act at all? And suddenly what we've done is we've brought this anxious feeling before the Lord, and then it feels like the Lord isn't answering. Well, and now we're anxious about that because we're like, oh my goodness, now God doesn't seem to be answering me. The problem is that we give these things over to the Lord. We trust that the Lord is going to answer, but then... At a moment's notice, we try to take control back because we think, God, you don't seem to be answering in the time that I want. And so when heaven seems silent, we default back to our own behavior, which is, I'm going to do this in my own power. I'm going to do this in my own strength. I'm going to do what I know I can do. And what ends up happening is it robs us of peace and joy. But beloved people, did you know that your peace and your joy are in direct proportion to your prayers. If you want to experience more peace and more joy, we need to pray more. And, and Paul says, you pray generally. He says you pray specifically. And he says you pray gratefully. And when we pray, we are able to experience a peace that passes, transcends all understanding. I mean, have you ever had one of those moments where you've, you've just spent time with the Lord and you sense an overwhelming peace? Like there's just a, a quietness with the Lord. There's a tenderness with the Lord. You, you speak and then you just pause and you listen and you just quiet yourself before the Lord. You humble your heart before the Lord, and then you just listen to what the Lord has to say. And sometimes it's like you'll finish that prayer, you'll say amen, and there is just this, this overwhelming peace that has rested upon you. But oftentimes, that's not the way we pray. We pray when we're in a hurry. You know, you're, you're frazzled. And you're spitting out at a prayer. And you're, you're wondering, why am I not experiencing peace in this? It's because we're not sitting in the presence of the Lord. Just trying to listen what the Lord has to say. How often do you and I rush into the presence of God, and then we rush right back out? 
I mean, sometimes it's like we stumble into the presence of the Lord. And you're like, oh, God, I got like three minutes. I'm on my way to work here. And uh, so, God, I could really use this happening in my life. And then, oh, I just spilled breakfast burrito on my shirt, right? You're like, oh, that guy just cut me off. And then, and then you're so frazzled. You're like, but, Lord, but, Lord, well, I got, I got a couple minutes. Lord, could you please just answer this prayer? Could you do this for me? Oh, wait, I got to go, God. I'm sorry. And you're out. And you wonder. Why am I not experiencing peace when I pray? Well, maybe it's because you've stumbled into the throne room of God. You try to place your anxiety there. But then because you're not praying longingly, expectantly, quietly before the Lord, then it's like you stumble right back out and you take that anxiety right back with you again. And, and what Paul is saying is, no, you pray. You pray before the Lord. You quiet yourself before the Lord. It's really not that big a mystery, but we struggle. And, and when we struggle with this, we, we fail to find peace. I mean, if you, if you want to experience a peace that passes all understanding, you have to bring it before the Lord in prayer. And sometimes you have to fight for prayer. You have to fight for that quiet time. Put down the other things and just focus on spending time with God. Notice fourth, we fight for thoughts that are true and right and pure. Joy is found in right thoughts. But you know, there's a principle at play in this. Your mind is going to dwell on something. What do you want your mind to dwell on? Notice what Paul says in verse 8. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. See, throughout this series, we've been saying that our joy can't be based on our circumstances. Our joy can't even be based on Jesus plus the things that are happening in our lives. That ultimately, our joy needs to rest in the person of Jesus Christ alone. This is where sometimes you and I can experience the battle. Because let's be honest, the world is filled with things that are not true. That are not admirable. That are not right that are not excellent, that are not praiseworthy. And it's so easy to focus on the junk and the garbage that's taking place all around us. I mean, how many of you have ever heard a song and then it just pops up in your head later on that week? Right? The choir will talk about that often. Like, hey, we sang this song on Sunday and then like this, I wasn't even thinking about it, but there it was, right? It just kind of pops into my head. I mean, I was thinking about that this week. How many of you remember? It's a, a cute movie, Inside Out, right? And so in that Pixar movie, like, there, there's this marble, this memory ball that gets, like, the, the triple, that gum, that, that, and it constantly gets pushed back up into the, into the kid's mind, right? So often, this is the way that you and I focus. It's like, we don't even think about things, and suddenly, all of these things are kind of coming to the surface of our minds, and the truth is, if you fill your mind with junk, it's gonna, what's going to rise up? It's going to be junk that rises up in our lives. If you fill your mind with lies, you're going to be filled with lies. If you fill it up with painful thoughts and painful conversations, well, that's what's going to be in your mind subconsciously that you're living out throughout the rest of the week. And you dwell on those things. And so maybe... Just maybe you need to get off of social media for a little while, right? I mean, maybe you have to turn off the news for a little while. Maybe you got to think about, okay, what am I watching? What am I listening to? What am I reading? What kind of music is filling my ears? I mean, just think about the kind of junk that just usually comes and that usually just kind of fills up our thoughts and our minds. Maybe there's websites that you're visiting that you shouldn't. There's things that you're watching that you shouldn't. There's things that you're listening to that you shouldn't. I mean, whatever that is, maybe... You just need to put those things aside. Because here's what happens. When you think about the truth, oh, you get what's true. If you think about what's right, 
Oh, you're going to get what's right. If you think about what's pure, you're going to get what's pure. And verse 8 just reminds us that where your mind rests, that's what you think about. So maybe for some of us, it's to say, well, what might be something better? Well, what if we, what if we said, hey, I'm going to start a scripture memorization plan. Like, I, I'm just going to, I just want, I, in those moments when I'm feeling I'm attack, I want to have a scripture passage that I can go to instead. And so maybe it's just starting small and just memorizing some scripture so that in those moments your mind is thinking about other things or your mind can quickly return to better things rather than stay in those negative things. Maybe we need to listen to good Christian music. I mean, maybe we need to listen to biblical messages and podcasts instead. Maybe we need to be reading admirable commentaries and articles. Look, there was a song I can remember as a kid. It was called Input Output. You know, your mind is a computer whose daily you use. And so it's like, you. how many of us have ever said to our kids, garbage in, garbage out? It's true. We know it. But we fill our minds with garbage all day long. Paul is saying, fill it with what's right, what's admirable, what's excellent, what's praiseworthy. Think about such things. And when you think about such things, ah, now I get to experience peace. Think for the things of Christ. And you'll be able to find unspeakable joy. Notice fifth. We fight with persistence. We fight with persistence. Verse 9 says, Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. Both of you, I, I believe that you have heard enough biblical truth over these past five weeks that if you applied these things to your life, it would radically change your life. And I'm going to tell you, if Pastor Andrew and I came back to this, this passage 10 years from now, the truth of Scripture does not change. The truth of what we're saying does not change. Like, people in the Bible for 2,000 years have been wrestling with what you and I also wrestle with. This is why. When you and I pick up the Bible, we need to remember we are not reading anything new. What is contained in these pages is what has brought Christians joy for thousands of years. We are not the first people to have to persevere through the things of this world. But the question is, will I act on what I am hearing? Will I put these things into practice? Will I be a person who is persistent, who is persevering? And look, I understand the longer we are in the battle, the wearier we can become. But we can also become battle-hardened because we're tested. And we're saying, Lord, I want to live into these truths. I'm telling you, living a life of unspeakable joy, this is not easy. But I believe this is what God is calling us to. But we have to be willing to put these things into practice. G.K. Chesterton said it this way. It's not that the Christian ideal has been tried and found lacking. It has been found difficult and left untried. We have to be willing to persevere. Even in those difficult days. There's going to be days when joy seems unspeakable. And yet if we engage in the battle, if we do the hard work that is necessary, I believe that we will be able to find a joy that is too great for words. That is in fact unspeakable. That passes all understanding. But if you, if you want to say rejoice in the Lord always, you, you have to be willing to put in the work, to fight that fight. And maybe in your own life you have to say, God, what are some of the things that need to change? 
What in my life do I need to think about differently? What in my life do I need to approach differently? God, how do I, how do I need to fight for gentleness in this relationship? How do I need to fight for peace? How do I need to fight for prayer? And then begin working towards those things, putting some things into practice. Because you and I know that there is a battle that is taking place for our hearts and minds. And where the battle is fought and won is in Jesus Christ. So let me say this. If you do not have a relationship with Jesus Christ, today is the day, now is the hour to do that. Because all of these things that we're talking about flow out of having a relationship with Jesus Christ. If he is not your Lord and Savior, do not leave this place without saying, Lord, I give you my life. And then you will be able to experience his joy and his peace that passes all understanding. Maybe for many of us who have been walking with Christ for some time, and maybe over time we have forgotten. Maybe over time we have lost some of these truths. What I pray is that this is a day where you are being reminded of the need to return. The need to say, I know today I've been losing this battle, but I'm going to fight again. For what is pure and right and excellent and praiseworthy. I'm going to fight for peace. I want to fight for joy. And I believe that as you and I do that, that we will be able to experience a joy that is unspeakable. What did we say? When are we to rejoice? Always. What should cause us anxiousness? Nothing. How, what do we pray about? Everything. And how far does God's peace extend beyond all understanding? Friends, let's rest in that this morning. Let's pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you that you call us to be a people of your word. And yet we recognize it is often difficult. And Lord, sometimes it's so difficult that we kind of say, well, then why should I even bother? Why should I even try? But Lord, what we are reminded of today is that the battle belongs to you. You're the one who has fought the ultimate battle against sin and death, and you have defeated it. And you have won us the victory. And yet, Lord, in our everyday, day-to-day lives, we can still feel the battle. And yet for us to know that you are fighting our battles for us, even as we walk this earth. And so, Lord, we know we can trust in you. We can lean on you and to be able to say, Lord, I desire to find unspeakable joy in your presence. And so, Lord, be about changing us this morning. Transform our hearts and our minds so that we may be a people who are living for you, who are finding peace that passes all understanding, and so that we are experiencing a joy that is unspeakable. So that, Lord, people around us may be able to look at our lives and say, I don't know how you are able to experience such a peace in that situation. And we would be able to tell them it is all about Jesus. So, Lord, would you take us, would you use us, transform us this morning into the people that you desire. And we pray all of these things in Jesus' name. Amen.